So hey everybody, um, woohoo, last case study. I can't believe we're all the way to um, week number 12. So by now you've probably figured out that um, I really love history and I really enjoy finding out more about these, um, the times and the events that are surrounding these case studies that we've been working on. And I selected the Denora air pollution incident of 1948 because I hadn't ever heard of it before. And I had really thought that Love Canal was the event that had launched awareness of the effects of air pollution and I guess ground and water pollution as well. I think I got a little bit um, long-winded on this, so you might want to bail out now. This might take me a while. So for five days in October 1948, a weather inversion spread a sandwich of cold, warm, and cold air over the Denora, Pennsylvania Avenue area, and it trapped toxic smoke from the mills in the valley. Between October 26th and the 31st, 1948, 20 people were asphyxiated and over 7,000 were hospitalized or became ill as a result of the severe air pollution um, in the town of 14,000 people. And that's according to a uh, newspaper reporter called um, Hopi who wrote some stories in 2008. So what was it like? The killer smog dropped dogs and cats in their tracks and it wilted flowers and houseplants. The community center was turned into a temporary morgue and the halls of the Monongahala Memorial and Charleriola Manison hospitals overflowed with the sick, according to Gamage in 1998. Thousands of people suffered severe abdominal cramps, splitting headaches, nausea, vomiting. Strong men and women who had no previous health problems were struck down. Doctors said that their respiratory systems were paralyzed. Elderly people who um, already had respiratory ailments found themselves choking and coughing up blood, according to the Denora Fire Department in 2009. So my main critique of the case study is that it switches back and forth between modern practices and actions of those in the 1940s, where industrial revolution um, regulations and government actions were few and far between. And also I thought about how to provide medical care for so many residents and how to move people out of the smog infested area. And I started thinking about this incident more as a flood scenario. So I'll explain that line of thinking later on in a couple of more slides. So until 1948, smoke belching from industrial plants in Denora and elsewhere was considered little more than a nuisance, part of daily life. It turned yards and hillsides barren, and for sure it sometimes made driving difficult, and it certainly made homeowners have to repaint their houses every few years from the corrosive smoke. One of the town residents said, it's like pollution from cars today, said Bill Shemp. He's an 81-year-old resident of Washington County town. That's the way it was. It was a normal way of life. So what I think of as unacceptable amounts of smog and pollution was an everyday occurrence in the early parts of the 20th century. And the Industrial Revolution made it possible to transform an amazing amount of raw materials into useful products and energy and production materials. But the byproduct was ubiquitous pollution. So this series of photos that you just saw, those came from 1909, 1919, 1922, 1927, 1931 and 35, 1938, 48, 52, 53. And then this last one, this is from October of 1955, and I love this picture, it's a picket at the Los Angeles County Supervisor's Office, and it mentions Denora, Pennsylvania over there on that left-hand side, that lady holding that sign. And what I really love about this picture is this group of white-gloved matrons with their handbags and their sensible coats, and then the woman who is fourth from the left wearing the gas mask. I just love the juxtaposition of, um, of those two images. So pollution and smoke and smog was something so located that these on folks a horseshoe bend in the Monongahela really River. The mid the Nora produced steel, steel wire, nails, zinc billets, um, and star athletes, and it also produced the fluoride-laced killer smog that eventually led to the study and regulation of air pollutants, according to that um, newspaper reporter I mentioned before, Hoppy, in 2008. You couldn't see to step off the curb or at the end of your hand remembered Dr. Charles Stanley, who's now 76. He was an equipment manager for Denora's football team in 1948. 
And during the football game, people and players were being summoned from the field to go home. One of the players, Stan Sua, went home and found that his father had died. So by Friday evening, local residents were crowding into nearby hospitals and dozens of calls were made to the area's eight physicians. Fire department volunteers administered oxygen to those who were unable to breathe. Board of Health member Dr. William Rungus led an ambulance by foot through the darkened streets to ferry the dead and dying to hospitals or to the temporary morgue. On Rongo's advice, those with chronic heart and respiratory ailments began to leave town late on Friday night. But before noon on Saturday, 11 people had died and conditions had not improved by Saturday night with roads congested by smog and traffic. Evacuation became impossible. This is according to um, an EPA alumni report authored in 2009. And as it was, hundreds were evacuated. One third of the population of the 14,000 residents experienced health problems and were hospitalized. The weather inversion finally ended on Sunday afternoon when a rainstorm blew through the valley. And just hours after that had happened, just hours after the mill had finally shut down its zinc smeltering operations, according to Hoppy in 2008. And according to the EPA's meteorologist, Brian Etter, what made this 1948 inversion different was the length of the duration. Inversions were not new to the area, but this one lasted for five days. And Dr. Etter made those comments on the Weather Channel program that aired in 2008 called When Weather Kills. It's kind of a dramatic program title. So the case study um, by uh, Valsic and Tracy tells us that, um, that I am the governor of a large industrial eastern state and my communication plan is to obtain updates on the investigations and the response actions from emergency services, hazmat, health and medical agencies. And I'll also reach out to local state federal agencies for assistance on industrial and hazardous waste regulations, medical care and cleanup. Because U.S. Steel is the responsible partner under hazardous materials and contamination regulations, my office, along with state and federal regulators, will ensure the plant operators do not exceed allowable thresholds and that all required pollution control mechanisms are in place and working properly. Because it's obvious where the contamination is coming from, if U.S. Steel doesn't correct these problems immediately or shut down the plant operations, I'll launch the process to levy administrative actions and fines. So the case study discusses the executive branch reaching out to the legislative branch to enact reg regulations and administrative guidelines. Blinding smog opened people's eyes to the mortal dangers of air pollution. It gave rise to local, regional, state, and national laws to reduce and control factory smoke and culminated in the nation's Clean Air Act of 1970. That's according to Templeton, who wrote in 1998. The Environmental Protection Agency and OSHA were also formed to help keep us safe. So this part of the case study seems a bit misplaced to me. On the other hand, the executive branch could use its police powers and civil enforcement powers that were available in 1948 to halt U.S. Steel's operations in the name of public safety. Eventually, the town Burgess actually declared a state of emergency, which was instrumental in forcing the mill to ramp down its uh, operations. And that's according to the Denora Fire Department, which compiled a pretty long list of newspaper articles and speeches in 2009. So here's my follow-up on the case study's suggestions of enacting legislation and holding the responsible party to account. Air pollution problems were recognized from the facility as early as 1918 when the plant owner paid off the legal claims for causing pollution that affected the health of nearby residents. In the 1920s, residents and farmers in Webster took legal action again against the company for loss of crops and livestock. Regular sampling of air began in 1926, but it stopped in 1935. And that's a quote out of the EPA's report that Gilbert authored in 2009. So the Pennsylvania Department of Health, United Steelworkers, Denora's Borough Council and the U.S. Public Health Service all participated in an, inv in an investigation in 1948 of, of the air pollution incident, Gilbert notes. 
The investigation was the first organized effort to document the health impacts of air pollution in the United States. Commenting on the studies of the incident, the Manison Daily Independent wrote that damage from air pollution from the zinc works was something that no scientific investigation is necessary to prove. All you need is a pair of reasonably good eyes. And that's one of um, the articles that was included in the Denora Fire Department's um, compilation of articles in 2008. And it's offered, authored by um, Snyder in 1994. So the studies of the Denora smog didn't actually fix blame and they couldn't document levels of pollution beyond workplace limits set at the time. The Public Health Service recommended a warning system tied to weather forecasts and an air sampling system to be installed to avoid future incidents. Lessons learned at Denora resulted in the passage of the 1955 Clean Air Act in Pennsylvania, and it began model, modern air pollution control efforts in the Commonwealth. And that's according to Snyder in 1994, and that's out of her uh, doctoral dissertation. In 1963, the U.S. Congress passed the first federal Clean Air Act. That was amended in 1970 to give it actual teeth and enforcement power. States are now required to plan for and to reduce pollution levels to meet federal clean air standards. That's according to McCabe in 1998. That was a speech um, provided. Um, he's the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency head um, for that area of the country. So nine years after the smog, the Denora Zinc Works were closed, put 900 men out of work. Ten years after that, U.S. Steel closed all of its Denora facilities for a total loss of 5,000 jobs in the area. And that's according to the EPA's Gilbert in 2009. A million dollar lawsuit was filed against the operators of the Denora Zinc Works, and that was a subsidiary of um, U.S. Steel. It was called the American Steel and Wire Company. The suit was actually settled out of court for about $250,000 in April of 1951. The firm, however, denied any responsibility for the disaster, despite the government's findings. It did install a weather station and other air pollution devices as precautionary measures, according to Gilbert. U.S. Steel eventually paid out an out-of-court settlement ranging from $1,000 to $30,000, and that's according to Thomas Farrell, who's a current U.S. Steel Group uh, spokesman. So a dollar in 1951 equals about $7 today, so that means that the payouts were about $7,000 to $210,000 in value. And that was reported by the Denora Fire Department's compilation of um, those newspaper articles that I mentioned before. So during the event, the elderly and seriously ill began experiencing respiratory trouble, Communities physicians were flooded with calls from concerned families. And as the physicians worked around the clock to treat the sick, they were assisted by nurses and other volunteers, including policemen and firemen, who went door to door administering oxygen. And those who made the rounds reported on the difficulty of finding their way to the homes. Drug stores remained open all night to fill prescriptions. Clergymen were called out to minister to the dying and their families. The Denora Board of Health met in an emergency session in the Red Cross and American Legion, and their auxiliaries set up an emergency station at the community center. Funeral directors offered their ambulances to carry the sick to the community center and the two hospitals um, as well. And that's quoted out of the Denora Smog Museum um, in 2009. So in mobilizing resources, I thought about how to provide medical care for so many residents and how to move people out of the smoke infested area. And I started thinking about this as a flood scenario. You know, we can't leave people stranded in a flooded area. And if we um, force, if we, even if we force U.S. Steel to shut the plant down to stop operations, the weather inversion will hold the smog in place. It's kind of like flood water waiting to recede. And who knows how long that's going to take. So since the smog is so thick and people can't drive safely because they literally can't see, an organized evacuation is needed as quickly as possible. Now, 14,000 people is a considerable amount of folks to move to, safely, to, move to safety in a, a quick manner. But I'm assuming, kind of laying over a, a layer of modern technology, I'm assuming that there's modern technology that can quote unquote see through the smog where human eyes can't. And so I'm gonna assume that those 
technologies can be implemented along with mass transit. So taking all of that into account, about 300 buses would be needed to move the 14,000 residents. But in order to avoid a Hurricane Katrina situation where evacuees have nowhere to go, I'm also going to assume, as the governor of Pennsylvania, that the Office of Emergency Management can activate host shelters through ESF-6 mass care in areas away from the smog. And as the governor of the state of Pennsylvania, I'm also going to ask emergency management to enact its EMAC, which is its Emergency Management Assistance Compact with other nearby states. But all of that is complicated with another form of patient movement. And that involves moving folks who are in long-term care facilities and hospitals whose medical conditions require um, the continuation of care during their evacuation. Switching back to our modern times and back to Florida, in that case, we have the patient movement plan, which is developed through the Florida Department of Health. Um, and that was developed for the Republican National Convention in 2008. The state's medical response teams, there's four of them. They're, they provide highly skilled medical personnel equipment and supplies to decompress hospitals and healthcare systems. There's also the Florida Fire Chiefs Mutual Aid Agreement for responding and moving people. Florida Sheriff's Association's Mutual Aid Agreement for providing security and ensuring safety. There's a state ambulance deployment plan, which redirects ambulances towards a disaster area to quickly move people out. And there's also the state aeromedical deployment plan, which can marshal all of the um, necessary trauma helicopters um, and organize those. And along with trauma, we've got regional trauma agencies. The Florida National Guard maintains three civil support teams who are highly specialized in chemical and hazardous materials incidents and have medical treatment skills. So during the height of the emergency, back in 1948, the Donora Fire Department was besieged with frantic calls, but soon help arrived in the form of mutual aid from other communities. The Pitcairn Fire Department arrived with an ambulance. The McKeesport and Rosedale Fire Departments loaned inhalators. And that's according to the Donora Fire Department in 2009. So what's Donora look like today? And what were the consequences and the outcomes of the, um, the smog incident of 1948? So our case study looks back and says that inaction and pollution control had a lot to do with how severe the event was. Looking backwards, our modern minds, you know, we really can't imagine why the authorities didn't shut down the mills sooner. And as the days passed and more pollutants went into the stagnant air, smog got worse, visibility kept decreasing. And despite the poor visibility that hampered motorists and pedestrians, many people went about their usual routine. The Halloween parade was held on schedule Friday night. The football game with Monongahela was played Saturday afternoon before a crowded pack at Legion's Field, despite the difficulty in actually seeing the ball or the players. And then the town Burgess actually declared a state of emergency and doctors started advising people with respiratory problems to leave town. But by Saturday night, heavily congested roads and the poor visibility made evacuations almost impossible, according to the Donora Fire Department in 2009. Things were tough back then, and you knew the mines and the mills were unsafe, said Duane Patterson, 70 years old, of Monongahela. But they put bread on the table, bread and butter. And that was reported by Hopi in 2008. The case study also talks about consequences. Too little, too late. When the fire bells rang on that evening, Bill Shemp and other firemen learned that they were to take oxygen to residents struggling to breathe. Shemp said that he had to feel his way along buildings and fences to go up the steps of each house and strain to make out the house number. Going several blocks took 45 minutes, the Denora Fire Department reports. Finding the right address, Shrimp could only give a struggling person a few shots of oxygen before departing to find the next address. It almost broke my heart to leave, he said. It was almost a terrible experience because it meant that you had to walk out of a house where people needed help. Eventually, doctors decided it was too dangerous for the firemen to cart the oxygen tanks, which weighed about 130 pounds, through the smog. 
Everyone went home to wait for the air to clear, and that was reported by the Denora Fire Department in 2009. In a November 1948 issue of Life magazine, Bill Rongas, a Denora physician, labeled the tragedy, quote unquote, murder from the mills. And he said that if the smog had lasted another evening, the number of deaths would have topped a thousand. So on items of note in the, key, in the uh, case study, Pittsburgh itself escaped the episode prim primarily because it had just begun to enforce a smoke control ordinance and it was cutting back on the use of bitumous coal as a fuel source. The Donora smog gained national attention when Walter Winchell broadcast the news of the disaster on his radio show. And that's according to Snyder's 1994 doctoral dissertation. The phone, after that uh, radio broadcast, phone lines were flooded with calls from concerned family and friends from out of town as word of the dis disaster spread on the radio and newspapers. And then some people were frightened by what was happening and they actually tried to leave town to go stay with relatives and friends um, until the emergency was over. And that was reported by the EPA's Gilbert in 2009. And then the long-term health effects. Denora's Special Investigating Committee asked the borough assessor to conduct a census. The assessor asked six assistants to interview 2,639 homes, which covered 11,765 individuals. He reported 21 deaths, 68 people left town, 4,951 people were evacuated, 6,814 were not affected, 880 people were treated by doctors within those five days. 366 people were unable to see a doctor. 47 folks went to the hospital. They think that that's a low number. 12 people reportedly went to the Mill Hospital. And they also felt that that was a low number. It might have been as high as 86 people, according to the EPA's Gilbert. Autopsy reports of many of those who died indicated acute changes in the lungs. The victims' ages ranged from 52 years to 85 years, according to the Denora Fire Department. And a decade later, the town's mortality rate remains significantly higher than that of the neighboring communities. So I think that the case study did a pretty good job of summarizing that a much more rapid and comprehensive response by both the townspeople and the officials in charge would have saved lives and it would have certainly helped people to get them out of harm's way ahead of time. I think that my flood analogy holds up because the longer those folks waited, the denser the fog got. And by the time they really panicked and realized that it, it was really time to leave, they couldn't get out because they literally couldn't see in front of their faces. So again, I think it's, it's sort of a, an appropriate analogy with Florida, especially when we see things coming like hurricanes, that we issue those alerts and those warnings well ahead of time. And we continue to try to find ways to get folks to understand that when those warnings are issued, time is of the essence. So I know this has been a, a long case study and I thank you for hanging in there with me. Um, I enjoyed reading more about this this event. I didn't even know that it existed. And um, it really got me a lot more interested in the effects of um, human caused disasters on populations. And then, like I said, time being of the essence to get folks out of harm's way as soon as possible. So I hope you enjoyed the case study. Thanks for hanging in there with me. I know it was a long one. Have a great day. Bye.